Hey, this is Ken at Capital Advantage Tutoring. It's my job to get you past the Series 7. And what I've been seeing in my chats, in my groups, in the study groups, everyone's worried about the math. And they've been telling me, Ken, why don't you just do a math video, put them all together. I have them all separately. So I'm going to bring them all into one and just do one long video of all the math, the formula, stuff like that. But here's the thing. It's not that big a deal. I mean, literally, I still think if you, other than options, and I'm not going to do options here because I'm a greedy bastard to make you pay for it, my fucking game-changing options, which will blow your mind how easy they are. I mean, ridiculously easy. Um, what you need to do is don't worry about the math. Just kind of watch this a little bit. I'm almost telling you not to watch the damn video, right? It doesn't sound like I'm saying don't watch the video, but I am saying watch it because maybe you pick up two or three formulas or some math stuff, and then you feel better about it, and you go on because the the vendors, Kaplan, as past perfect, SDC, love the math, including Achievable. They all love the math. I think they all overdo it a little bit because this test is much more about theory. I mean, even the option questions, if say you get 30, you're going to get 15 math and 15 theory. So a lot of it's more about knowing what they're for, less than the math. But let's get into it and see what I can do and how I can fuck it up. So again, this is all about the math. But remember, I'm not going to do the options. So options is definite. It's a, you have to do it and go check out my videos and I promise you, They'll, they'll change your life as far as options go. Okay, now, when we're investing in something, we kind of want to know what our yield is going to be. So they're going to ask about current yield, or what we call dividend yield, same thing. Okay, so you're going to want current yield. I'll do a couple problems here. So remember, current yield is just your annual over market price. So remember, AMP, okay? Greg gave me this great thing. We were talking, and he goes, and he came up with his AMP. So like, like currents, electricity of AMPs. So remember, AMP, annual over market price. So all that's all we're doing here is just going to do the annual return. And you don't have to go 8.5 times 1,000. It makes it too hard. Look, just do 8.5, 8.5 divided by 1020. And that's going to give you, we'll do the actual math here, 8.5 divided by 1020 equals 0.0083, right? So that looks like a weird number, but look, it just kind of matches, right? 0.0083. Now we can just turn that into... 8.33, because it really turns out to be 0.0083, 333, all a bunch of threes, okay? So we can match that up with this problem. And here, and at first you think, wait, what? how do I know that it's going to it's gonna go that way? Like, how do I know that it's going to match this? Because here's the thing. Say over here they wrote 8.83%. Look, you have to have a little common sense here. If the bond is at 8.5, it's going to be somewhere within a range of that, especially if it's not that far. I mean, if it was trading at 4,000, they wouldn't do it, but it's going to be somewhere in the range, like between seven and nine or seven and 10. So it's going to be in there. So if you match the numbers up, like if they showed you 83%, you know that's wrong. And if they showed you 0.83%, you know that's wrong because it's too far away. So you can just do it this way. Don't overthink the shit. Again, I'm, not, I'm the king of non overthinking because I'm a dumbass. Um, just look for this and then match the numbers up. Boom. There you go. That's one example. Let's do a couple more. Okay, so this one is a little different. If the coupon yield is 7.5% and, and a bond maturing in 15 years, what is it? remember, you'll never have to do yield to maturity. I promise you won't have to do that. You can watch my bond triangle video to understand how that works. Um, current yield is what you're earning each year, right? So I should have said that in the other one, but it is. It's what you're earning each year. And they're going to ask you that a couple of times, whether it's on bonds or on dividends or on you know stuff like that. So here, 7.5%. A bond purchase at 98.25. Ooh, so we have to remember something. If you see a decimal or dash, it's a treasury. So we have to play around a little bit again. So we have to do this. We have to do, this is 98-25, which is really 98 and 25, 30 seconds. So we have to do 25 divided by 32. So we're going to do that on the calculator. 25 divided by 32, that equals 0 0.781. And then on the calculator, you just add it on there. So now you have... Add 98 to it, 98.781. And there you go. That's your number. Now, that's not the bond. The bond is really trading at 987 and 81 cents. But for, for this thing, we can do it. Again, remember, it's AMP. Annual, 7.5 divided by 98.781. And let me do that on the handy-dandy calculator. 7.5 divided by 98.781 equals... 7.59 and boom, there's letter C. So that's all I did. So 7.59 is my number. That is how we do that. That's a corporate, that's not a corporate bond, it's a treasury. So remember, if you see a decimal or a dash in the quote, it has to be a treasury, which means it's out of 30 seconds and you have to do that number first. 
don't forget that. And they won't always say government. Sometimes they'll just give you the decimal or dash and not tell you. Okay, so now let's do one for dividend yield, okay? So we're gonna do it for dividend yield now. This is for, it's current yield still, but it's on stock, okay? So this is a, earns $5 a share, don't care, pays a quarterly dividend of 75 cents a share. The current market price is 75. So we have to figure out what the annual is. Remember, AMP, annual. So 75.75 times four equals three. So that's $3 a year. So it means we're gonna get three bucks. And then what we're gonna do, we're gonna divide it by the market price of $75. We're gonna do three divided by 75. My fingers would work three divided by 75 equals four. That's gonna, it's gonna come out as 0.04 and we can match that, okay? Should be 0.04. Two, a little extra zeros never hurt you. That's that, so that's gonna be 4%. So it's not so hard even with the dividend stuff. Let's see if we can find another one. So this one's a little more complicated. There's a lot of crap in it, right? So corporation is capitalized the following way. To ventures, blah, 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 preferred, blah, 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 common. So they said, what if the current yield of the preferred is trading at 62? What is current yield if the preferred is trading at 62? So this a little, we have to do a little work. So we have to go, okay, well, it's trading at 62. We assume, you know, that's the second part of the problem. We have to find the annual. You don't have to, since they're doing per share, you don't have to figure out what 5% of 50 grand is. Just makes it too hard, right? And you could do all that crap, but it makes it hard. So we're just going to do five. I do it there so I don't ruin anything. You're going to do five divided by 62. Again, let's do that. Five divided by 62 is 0.08 and change. And that's how we do current yield. Okay. So not hard. It, yeah, it should do different ways with stock and bonds, all different ways. Just remember the big thing everyone gets is if it's a dividend, make sure that if it says quarterly, you're going to do multiply by four. And if it's a treasury, if it's a decimal or dash, make sure you do this at a 30 seconds part. Okay, let's move on to the next. Okay, so the next one we're gonna talk about is convertibles, right? So what the hell is a convertible? A convertible is like a bond or preferred that turns into common. And a lot of times it's like, well, let's talk about this for a second. So if you have a convertible bond, you have you do not, if once you own that, you are not gonna convert that under pain of death. Rip it out of my cold, dead hands, okay? Because you're getting, if you buy a convertible, you're getting income, and the growth portion of the stock because it turns into stock. So you wouldn't do that unless they force you to do it. So if they call the bond or something like that, then you would do it. Other than that, you ride the, you ride the money train, right? Get the income and the growth. It's a good thing. So let's show you how to do the math on how to decide whether we sell it, convert it. I have two problems that are vastly different. They're going to help you. So stay tuned. And welcome back. So here, let's read number three. A company offers $10 million of 8% 20-year debentures. Each debenture is convertible to common at $50. The bondholder needs to liquidate 10 convertible debentures. The market sale of the bonds is 102, and the market value of the common is 53. Which of the following actions should the bondholder take? Okay, so let's get into this. So we have to decide, we have to do apples to apples, because right now we have a $53 stock and a $102 bond. We don't know which is the better choice. So what we want to do is make sure that we're on the right track. So let's do the math here. So First step is always, first step is always, 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 always par divided by the convertible price. Now, sometimes, and I'll show you another question where they actually do it for you, but in this case, you have to do it. Par divided by the convertible price. It's where it trades, like you'll see the word converts at or converts into stock at a price. They'll always have the word at at it because at, 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 it's like a, at, at, at. okay, so now, um, so we're going to do, a thousand divided by fifty, right? That's the bar. So we're gonna do a thousand divided by fifty. That's gonna equal twenty. That's my ratio. That means for every bond I convert, I'm gonna get twenty shares of common. So now, what is it? Now, what's the next step? So now I have to do one of two things. If they don't give me the common price, I'm gonna divide the bond by that. I'm gonna do a thousand twenty divided by twenty. So I can do that. I don't like that way. I don't think it's as intuitive. One oh two oh divided by twenty. That would mean that would means it's worth about 51. So if I did 1020 divided by 50, that equals 51. And I can do the math here and go, that's lower and that works. And that's the parity. Okay. I don't like that way, but you can do that way if they don't give you the stock price. If they say, what should the parity be? You just do bond price divided by the ratio. And look what I did. Look how I wrote that wrong. See, you guys didn't catch me. What's going on? Here, pretend it didn't happen. Woohoo. Okay, so now. So that's 51. Okay, so I did it on my calculator, right? 
So then you'd see that the stock is trading at 53. The parity is only 51. So the stock is better. But I don't like that way. It's not as intuitive. I'd rather do it this way. You're going to get 20 shares of a 50 to $3 stock, right? So if you convert, you get 20 shares and the stock's trading at 50. So you would do 20, the ratio, times 53. That would equal 1,060. So that's 1,060. So I look at this and go, okay, if I convert it, I get 1,060 versus selling it for 1,020. And all this person wants to do is sell it, is to get rid of the money, get rid of the bonds and all this stuff. So 1,060 is the better choice because it pays them more. Hope that helps a little bit. Now we have more to do. We're going to do more convertibles. Now let me, this, this is a question you could see, right? And let's talk about different ways they can do that. What, what if they added in and it was callable at 107. So then you do the same thing. You just do the, which one of these is better? I can convert it 1,060, sell it at 1,020, or let it be called at 107. So in this case, I would tender the bond because that's higher. So all I'm doing is comparing these three numbers, but I want apples to apples. So I always like to go up and multiply if I can. If I can't, I'll divide because I have to, but I much prefer doing it this way. So let's try another problem. Okay, so let's look at this one. This is preferred stock. It's still convertible preferred. So it's sort of the same thing. And guys, don't worry. Guys and girls, don't worry. Guys and girls, don't worry about whether you're going to get the number right or not. Because even if you do 100 par versus 1,000, the numbers sort of work out. They kind of, You can still compare them. It's not ideal, but it still works. And don't panic about it. So this is $100 par. Pay attention because sometimes they list the pars different. Doesn't mean it's going to be different, but... Let's assume, let's assume here it's $100 par, but sometimes it could be 50 or 25. So first of all, look at this. I always say they have to tell you how many shares you get or give you the convertible price. Well, here they give you how many shares, okay? They already said how many shares, so you don't have to worry about that anymore. So now you're going to get two shares of common. So they did the first step for you. You should be like, that's awesome. So I'm going to do two, two times 52, and that would equal 104 in my book. So now all I do is compare. I go, okay, do I convert it for 104 or do I sell it for 104? I'm literally the same thing, kissing your sister, crap. So I go, okay, ah, but it's callable at 105. So I'll make more. Now on capping and stuff, what will happen is in reality too, once they call the bond or the preferred, this price will go to 105. So it doesn't matter what you do there. But in this scenario, we assume it hasn't changed. 104 is here. 104 is my selling it, but 105 is call. So I will tender to the call. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, this is never an answer. If they call it, hold rather than deliver is not a thing. You don't get that choice. Okay. Okay. That's convertibles. Oh, I might have one more for us. Let's see if we can find it. Okay, here's another good one. It's, it is still mathy, but it's not as much. So a convertible debenture may be exchanged for 40 shares of common. So see, they did it for you already. They gave you the ratio of 40 shares. So we know we get 40 shares. We're going to have to do something with that. If a bond is selling at 114 and the stock is selling at 29, which is the most, which is going to be a profitable arbitrage. So that's the word I'm looking for. So you know that there's another word in this thing. So now we have to do the math here. We know we get the ratio. So we're going to, let me open up the calculator or my phone really. Okay. So we're going to do the calculator. We're going to do 40, right? So that's where it's going to be here. 40 times, where's the trading? 29. That's going to equal, I think, 1,116, but let's double check. 40 times 140 times, I can't use the calculator, to 1,160. So it's 116, 116, which is really 1,160, okay? So now we have, our, we can compare. So if I sell it, I get 1,140 or 114. And if I convert it, I get 1,160 or 116. So I'm going to go with the convert every time. Now, they're not actually asking that. And in reality, they could have crossed out this whole top and just left this word profitable arbitrage. What's a profitable arbitrage? So arbitrage is when you do two things at the same time to capture, to lock in a change. So in reality, if I look at this, I can go, oh, I can buy the bond for 114, immediately convert the shares and sell it and make 20 bucks. The risk is that between me converting, buying it, converting it and selling the shares, the stock could drop. So I'm gonna avoid that risk by doing them both at the same time. I'm gonna buy the bonds. In this case, I'll buy 10 bonds for however much money that is, 10 times 1140, whatever the hell that is. And then let's just say one. I will buy one bond at 114. And then at the exact same time, I will sell short the shares, 40 shares of common for this 29 and get 116 or 1160. 
So what happens is I buy the bond for 11.40 and I short 40 shares at $29 for 11.60 and I can make the $20 there because I'm shorted. And then once I convert the shares, that pays off my short. So that's an arbitrage. Always remember an arbitrage is buying one thing and shorting another in two different markets. Totally legal. It's not manipulation or anything. As long as you're doing it in two different markets to make a profit between the two. And it always goes one way. So even if you don't say anything, remember this. It's this. Uh, of course, it's white. I can't see it. Here, right here. It's always going to be buy the bonds, short the shares. There's no other way to do arbitrage on a bond. You can buy the bonds, short the shares. It is never buy the shares, short the bonds. It doesn't work because you can only convert one way. You can't go the other way. So I hope that helps with convertible stuff. I think that answers most of the questions you get. We should move on. But come on, guys. Let's get out of here. Okay, let's stick with the bond world. So we're going to go with um, amortization and accretion. So remember, there's a couple of things here. Accretion is when you take a discount and add a little bit of a discount in every year because the IRS wants to fucking tax you. Okay, so fuck it, fuck the IRS. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, they'll be at my door in a minute. So hopefully you didn't hear it. Now it's one thirty in the one forty in the morning, so I'm probably a little punchy. So. Accretion is if you buy a bond for 800 bucks, right? I'll do it on the screen in a second. If you buy a bond for 800 bucks and at maturity it becomes a thousand, like an original an OID zero coupon. Well, the IRS is not getting any of that money for 10, 15 years. So they go, no, screw that. We want some of it. So they're going to say, you have to take a little bit of that discount every year, add it to your cost basis, increase your cost basis. And then we're going to tax you on that. Now, if it's a muni, don't worry about it. You don't have to pay taxes. But if it's a corporate treasury, you do. Okay. So again, a OID you must create. I've said that you should have heard that. And then on the premium side, only munis have to amortize. Corporates and treasuries don't have to. Easy way to remember it. There's a lot of people have memory tools. It's fine, but I'm big on what does work. So OID you must create. Muni premiums you don't have to. Well, let's try to do some math here, and then I'll show a problem. We have a bond trading at 800 bucks. It's an OID, so we're going to have to create right. I'm going to say it's a muni, but I'm just going to leave that alone now. Let's say it's 10 years to maturity. 10 years to maturity, easy stuff. So the first step is always, I call it the, dis, the distance from par, the amount away from par, either the discount or the premium, literally accretion and amortization are the same thing, just reversed. So accretion is on a discount, amortization is on a premium, and either way you're moving closer to par as you go along. So this is an $800 bond, so it's 200 below par, so we're gonna do 200 divided by 10. So again, it's the number of years, it's the distance from par, right? The discount divided by years to maturity. Can I spell it? And I did it. Okay. Discount divided by years to maturity. So here we go. It's $200 discount. Remember, it's not the 800. It's the discount. So 200 divided by 10 is 20 bucks a year. So that means we're going to add the cost basis, 20 bucks a year. So let's say after three years, we sell at 900. Okay, we sell it at 900. So what we're going to do first is we have to figure this out. Now, there's one way to do it. I'm going to show the old, old-fashioned reverse engineer. So after one year, it's 820. We added 20 bucks. That's your cost basis. After two years, it's 840. And after three years, it's 860. So that's our new cost basis of 860. We sold it at 900. So we have a $40 capital gain, which is taxable. Okay. Remember, always remember, cap gains are always taxable. Ordinary income may not. So even this is a muni, the $20 increase in cost base of the accretion is not taxable because it's interest income. But if you sell it for more than the accreted amount, you're going to have a cap gain. And they could ask you a question in the books they do. Oh, you accreted for three years and you sold it at accreted value. Well, then you have no capital gain or loss because you're selling it at your new cost basis. So let me show you amortization because that's accretion. Not hard. This isn't brain surgery, okay? This shouldn't be that hard. It should, maybe one or two questions max. Okay, here we go. So this is a corporate, a customer purchases a corporate bond, which I say you don't have to amortize with at 105 with 10 years to maturity and, the, and they choose to amortize the premium. Okay, so the customer chooses to amortize it. Six, six years later, the customer sells the bond at 103. What is the tax consequences? Everyone goes, oh, I want it to be a $20 loss. Let's not go there. So first of all, we take the distance from par. So this is 1,105, which is really 1,050. So we're going to take 50, divide it by 10. That equals five bucks a year. And then, so now I could just do for six years, I go 1,050, 45, 40, but I don't want to do that because I'm fucking lazy. So I'm going to do, so it's six years later, I'm going to do six times five. Six times five. That equals 30. 
That means I'm going to drop the price by 30. Now, do not do it from 105, please. Do it from 1,050. I get that all the time, and they go, 75. I'm like, no, it's not 75. So do 1,050 minus 30. That's going to equal, what does that equal? 102. So that's 1,020. That's our new cost basis. So in reality, we bought it. Our quote is 102, but we really bought it at 1,020. And then we sold it at a 103, which is really 1,030. So the difference between my new cost basis of 1,020 and the white lines you can't see, and 1,030 is a $10 gain. So it's going to be B as in boy. So that's amortization. Again, this none of this math stuff is super hard. That, that's You have to keep that in mind, that it's not really that hard. It seems hard when you look at it and the books to make, make it complicated. But this is what I tell everyone. If you're doing algebra, you're doing something wrong. So we have more shit to do. Let's see what else we got on our list. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, accrued interest, which you normally won't get a lot, but let's get into it. I'm going to say let's get into it like 40 times. So just ignore that, whatever. Okay, so we're going to do accrued interest. So understand what accrued interest is. Sometimes it helps a little bit. So if you have a bond that trades, that pays every January and July, okay? You bought it, you owned it from January. It's now held all the way to July. You get paid every six months based on the coupon. So it's a 10% coupon and they pay you for the previous six months. So this would be a 10% bond. You're going to get 50 bucks every six months. We got that. But now if you bought the bond and you held it in January, you got your 50 bucks and then you sold it in May. Well, here's what's going to happen. You've been accruing interest every day because you remember, this is a loan to the company. You're entitled to that interest. So if you sell it in May, here's the thing. I buy it from you. I'm getting the entire 50 bucks in July. Screw you. So what I have to do is I have to pay you the interest that you've earned from January till until the day before it settles. So remember, you count up to the day, up to the day before it settles, no matter what day it is, whether it's Christmas, July 4th, it doesn't matter. If the thing settles after Christmas, the day after Christmas or July 5th, you're counting to July 4th. You can't settle on those holidays, but you are counting up, including those holidays. So here's the thing, though. So corporates and munis use a 30-day month, 360-day year, and they're T plus two. Treasuries are, what are they? They're actual Actually, a 365 day year, and they're T plus one because it just got to be fucking different. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Okay. Super excited. Now, so let's go into how we figure this out. So, again, both bonds are bought on Monday, May 10th, and it's a J and J bond, which means it pays every January and July. So, let's start with this one. So, we have, we know we're going to buy them down here. I'm going to put May 10th. Now, when does it settle? So, it settles on May 12th. So, you go back a day. So, it settles on May 12th. So, we're going to, May is here. That's going to be 11 days. Because remember, we don't count the day we settle. That's my bond. That's my interest going forward. But up until settlement, it's your bond. So my, we have 11 days in May. And then we have going back to January, January, February, March, April. And since it's a corporate or, or a muni, it's going to be a 30 day month. So it's 30, 30, 30, 30. So all we do is add them up 30, 60, 90, 120. Hut. Plus, uh, plus 11, so that should be 131 days, I think. 131 days. So that's probably don't even have to go this far on the test, but I do it anyway so you can get through all the vendors. Now, that works. That's easy. I like it. Not a problem. Let's jump to the treasury. It gets a little more hairy, but it's not so bad. If you buy it on Monday, May 10th, it settles on the 11th. We got that. So, you, so it's T plus one, so we go back. So it's really going to be in May. In May, it's only 10 days, okay? Now, M10. Sounds like a bus I have taken. Now we have to now the other thing is we have to go January, February, March. Isn't there a song? January, February. Okay. Now January, far, February, March, April, and then May. So those are the four months. Now it's different here because they're using actual. So you need to understand the months of the year. If you have to do this, which is highly doubtful. Again, I'm wasting your time here. But now. If you really got to figure out, you can learn that 30 days has September, blah, blah, blah. But, or you can do the knuckle trick, okay? The knuckle trick is you start with your fist, punch yourself in the face because you're doing this. Now, you start with January. Is Every knuckle is a 31-day month, indentations or not. God, please, you have to know that February has 28 or 29 days. If it's a leap year, it's 29, but they'll say it. I doubt even they're going to do it. So let's go. January is 31. Then we have the knuckle. Indent, in, in, that's 28. 
then March is 31, then April is 30, May is 31, all the way out. Now, remember, when you get to July, you double hit because the July and August are the ends, like the back ends. And I always think, well, they're Julius and Augustus Caesar. They were arrogant. They wanted long months. So you double hit the knuckle July, then August, then September is 30 because it's an indentation. October is 31 because it's a knuckle. November is 30 because it's an indentation. And December is a knuckle. It's 31. So the two ends... December and January, back-to-back 31s, and July and August are 31s. Everything else pretty much rotates. So let's do it here. So this takes some real math. So we got 31 days in January, good old 28 in February, 31 in March, and 30 in April. There we go. So now let's do this. Let's add them up. That's all we're doing. It's easy shit. 31 plus 28 plus 31 plus 30 plus... 10. So that's 130 days. Boom. Easy stuff. Now, oh, yes, you're asking me, what if they ask you how much you pay? Because the dumb vendors do that all the time, and the test doesn't. I apologize if you hear me coughing. I'm going to try to delete them, but I'm not that good at that. I don't edit that much. I just edit dead spots. Now, let's do this. So here, this is super easy. The books try, I mean, God, the books make it so fucking hard. But here's why you do it. How much does this bond pay you every year? One bond pays a hundred bucks a year, right? That's easy. Okay. So that means a hundred bucks a year. Now on the corporate side, it's 360. So you do a hundred divided by 360. You should know where I'm going with this. Do a hundred divided by 360 equals 27.7 cents, whatever. I'm going to just say 27, 7.277 cents. That's each day I get 27 cents. Do you know where I'm going with this? I hope you do. I'm going to do 27 times 131 times 131 days. So I would have to pay this person $36.38. $36.38. Boom. Now let's go over to the treasury side. The treasury side, a little different because it's actual. So we have to do 100. I'll do it here. I'll write it in here so we have it. So you can look at 100 divided by 365. Divided by 365 equals, that's 27.3. So it's a little bit less. Point. Two seven three it makes sense. It's only five more days. Then I'm going to do that times 130 days. So for the treasury, I'd only have to give you the grand total of $35 and 61 cents. How about if I typed it? 35.61. Again, accrued interest, that's really all it is. You're, most of the time, you're just going to have to know that you pay to the end. Now, there's one thing that they may screw you up on the vendors. If most bonds pay on the first, but they could pay on the 15th because those are the choices. If it pays on the 15th, the first month, okay, let me clear this out. I'm just going to give it to write. The first month is going to be a weird one. So if it pays on the 15th, okay, the first month, if it's a 30-day month, you do 16. If it's a 31-day month, you do 17 days. That's it. So if it's a 30-day month, you do 16 days, 16 days for the first month. And if it's a 31-day month, you do 17 days because you're counting the 15th and that's why it goes. It's almost like just... Whatever number you think it is, add one. Okay? That's all it is. Nothing crazy. Now, this one will absolutely be on the test. Okay? Tax equivalent yield. And I'm going to do some problems with that. So, tax equivalent yield is literally you're trying to find whether the bond, whether you should buy a muni or a corporate. I'm going to show you my way, and then I'm going to do some problems. Okay. So, really, the question is, which bond should I be in? Should I be in the 9% corporate or the 7.5% GO? I just don't know. So we have to kind of play around with, you look at it, you go, oh, the 9% corporate every time. But if you pay taxes on the corporate, so you have to kind of figure this shit out. So what you have to do is figure out what you're going to pay in taxes or what you're not going to pay in taxes. So if, if you do anything with tax equivalent, it's either going to be multiply times the corporate or divide the muni. Remember that multiply the corporate or divide the muni, not both. Multiply the corporate or divide the muni. So we're going to do this. So if I'm in the 20% bracket, can we agree that I'm bringing home 80%? If you pay 20% in taxes, you're bringing home 80%, or you can just do 100 minus. That could be the question. So I'm going to do this. So I'm going to do, that means I bring home 80%. So I'm either going to multiply seven, nine times 80% or do seven and a half divided by that. I'll do both. You're not supposed to do both, but I'm showing you. So if I do nine, you don't even worry about the percentage, just multiply. Nine times 0.8, Okay. 9 times 0.8 is 7.2. So after taxes, you'll bring home 7.2%, okay? So the corporate bond 
would not be as good as a geo. The geo is better. That works. Okay. Now let's change it up a little bit. Let's let's say we didn't know that, and let's go with. What if I'm on the 80% and I don't get the corporate? I want to find out the tax equivalent yield. They'll say that. It means they don't give you this number and you have to decide what would this be equal to. So you're going to do 7.5 divided by 80% or 0.8. So you're going to do 7.5 divided by 0.8 equals 9.375. So the taxable equivalent of the GO would be 9.375%. So that's still better than the corporate and that works. Okay. Just to make it a little fun, I'm going to change this number. Ooh, I shouldn't have done that one, huh? Okay, I, I know why. I'm going to change this number to 15%. Very on the low end tax bracket, okay? Because remember, rich people buy munis, poor people buy corporates. So let's go to this one here. So now we're going to do this. You're in the 15% bracket. I keep doing that. I'll keep doing that a million times. You're in the 15% bracket. So 100 minus 15 or the opposite of up is 85%. So now you're just going to either multiply the corporate times 85%. So let's do that. Nine times 0.85 equals 7.65. So if I bought a corporate bond and I'm in the 15% bracket after taxes, this works out to be 7.65%, which is better than the GEO, slightly better than the GEO. Okay, that's one way to look at it. Now, the other one is, I could do seven point, to find out the corporate equivalent, I would do 7.5 divided by 0.85. That gives me 8.82. So the, to the equivalent here would be 8.82. So that's the kind of corporate bond I would have to get to match the GO. Since I can get a nine, I would choose a nine. That's a better bond. So that's all tax equivalent is. Just We're gonna do a couple problems from the board. And we'll see what happens. Okay, so here's one. A customer is in the 28% bracket and buys a tax exempt bond. Tax exempt means muni of 9%, which I would wish I had a 9% muni. What is a taxable equivalent for him? It must've been in like the 80s he wrote this question. So what is a taxable equivalent for him? I was like 15. So you're gonna just go tax equivalent means you're gonna divide. So it's a muni you're gonna divide by 100 minus a tax bracket. So boom, right there. It's nine divided by 0.72. That's all it is. Nine divided by 0.72. That's some easy stuff. Let's do a harder one. Okay, so here's another one. So a tax exempt mutual fund has a current yield of 4%. For a customer in the 22% tax bracket, the taxable equivalent yield is what percent? So tax exempt means muni, so we're going to divide. So you have to do 100 minus 22. That gives me 78. So that's 78%. I'm going to use 0.78 because I don't want to be an idiot. And since it's immune, I'm going to divide 4 divided by 0.78 equals 5.128, which is really 5.13, close enough. So that's all it is. It's really just, I'll put it on here just so we don't get crazy. I'm going to do 4 divided by 78%, which is really 0.78 in case you don't have it. So 4 divided by 0.78 equals 5.128. You can round up and there you go. That's what that is. That's, it's not that hard on that. Let's see if I have another one more about theory. Let's see where we can. Okay, here's another one. Identify the formula for calculating the yield tax, taxable equivalent yield. That's all you're doing. So you're going to remember it's the tax exempt yield, the yield divided by 100 minus the tax bracket. Now, the other word they use here is marginable. Marginal, marginable tax, marginal tax bracket is the top tax bracket. That's the one you use. So it's going to be B as in boy. Tax exempt yield divided by 100 minus the marginal, which is going to be whatever. We just did it two seconds ago. Okay, so the next one is stock splits, okay? So what is stock split? It's literally, literally just a marketing tool to make a stock look better. So we'll do both reverse and forward and 10% stock dividend while we're here. So let's get into it. Okay, so I'm giving us two scenarios here. One, these are all the different choices of stock splits. So each thing will be its own separate scenario. I'm doing the option the option, and then the stock. So we do both. So let's start with the first one. So my method of doing stock splits is super easy. I just divide the first by the second every time. Three divided by one equals three, right? Okay. So then you take that three and then multiply it. Let me write it here so it's separate. A little magic on the whiteboard. Okay, so now all I do is I take the three and multiply times the shares. So that's 330 divided by three, that's 10. So now the new price here will be 300 shares, at ten dollars, and there's no difference, right? There's really no difference. Now, since it's an even split, even split means into one, three to one, four to one, five to one, ten to one, thirty to one doesn't matter. 
Okay. What we do on the option is this, oh, as far as a even split goes, it's the same thing. So we're just going to go one. So we're going to have three contracts. Okay. So three divide, so multiply. So we're going to do three times one. That's three contracts, A, B, C. And then I got to really do math. Why didn't I make it easy on myself? 40 divided by three equals 1333. So I'm going to have one, three A, B, C, 13.33 calls. Okay. So, that, so if it's an even split, the number of contracts does change, okay? So if it's an even split, the number of contracts does change. So now as each I'm going to do, I'm going to wipe out the information. Let's move this up so it's, so it's right at the top. Down, so out of the way, we don't get confused, okay? So now we're doing a five for two. That's not an even split. So we actually have to do the same thing. They're all, I love muscle memory. Same thing every time. Five divided by two. What are you going to get? Five divided by two, five divided by two, it was 2.5. So our multiplier is now 2.5. So all I'm going to do is do 2.5 times 100. So that should be 250. Right? If I do the math right, don't do it in your head, Ken. Don't be an idiot. 100 times 2.5 equals 250. And then I'm going to do 30 divided by 2.5. I'm not doing it by 250. I'm doing it by 2.5. Same number. 30 divided by 2.5 equals 12. So now if it was a five for two, we have 250 shares worth 12 bucks. That's easy. Now the hard part of this is on the option because you can't have half a contract. So you can remember that no quarter halves a contract. So if you come up with like 1.2 contracts, you're screwed. So remember each contract is a hundred shares, right? Do we agree on that? Yeah, we should. So all we're going to do is multiply this times the number of shares in the contract. Okay. So this is not the new contract is still going to be one but it's going to be 200, worth 250 shares. And then we do 40 divided by 12 equals 340 divided by 2.5 equals 16. Yeah, sometimes you can check your numbers. So you're going to have one ABC worth of 250 shares, 16 call. That's all it is. Remember, you're just changing the amount of shares. If it's The only time you change the contracts is a forward even split. Everything else, you adjust the contracts inside the contracts. Okay, that's good. I think we got that down. Let's get rid of this one now. Okay, first step is always first divided by the second. So I'm going to do one divided by four. I'm not going to do it in my head. One divided by four equals 0.25. So that's my new multiplier. I'm going to do 0.25 times 100. 100 times 0.25 equals 25. And then 30 divided by 0.25 equals 120. So now my new shares, I have 25 shares at 120. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. Now, let's go on to the option side. So again, if you want to double check, also, let's talk, instead of me just blowing this off and going crazy, if you have a reverse split, you're going to get less shares worth more. It's usually a marketing tool, and it's usually a sign that the company's in trouble. Because it usually, if it goes down to like 30, 40 cents or 10 cents or a nickel, they'll do a one for 100 or one for 30 or something like that to get the stock higher. I mean, Citigroup did it. They couldn't get over five bucks. So they did a one for 10. Boom. All of a sudden, they're a $40 stock. So remember, if you owned 100 shares of 30, you now own less shares, but worth more. Okay. Now, on the, on the contract side. Okay. So now we go over here, 0.25. So we're going to do 100, one contract with 100 shares. We're going to multiply 100 times... 0.25, where is my 0.25? I should put it in here. My 0.25, I'm going to do 100 divided by 0.25. That gives me 25 shares. And then I'm going to do ABC. And then I'm going to do 40 divided by 0.25. That gives me 160. So now I have one contract still worth 25 shares only, but the strike is just 160. So again, you don't change the contract amount, the contracts, unless it's an even split, you change what's in the contracts. Okay, time to erase. 15% stock dividend. This is just as easy. You take whatever the dividend is and you put 1.15 in front of it. Or if it's a 25% dividend, you do 1.25. If it's a 10% dividend, you do 1.1. So easy. There's your multiplier. You're gonna do 100 times 1.15. That's gonna give 115. Then you do 30 divided by 1.15 equals $26. So, you, so now it's 115 shares worth $26.08. And if you multiply 98, must be late. Yeah, it's two o'clock in the morning. Oh, eight. Okay.
Let's do it on the contracts here. So it's still one contract, but now it's going to be worth 115 shares because I do 100 times 1.15, right? Bring that over. And then I'm going to do ABC. And then I'm going to do 40 divided by 1.15 equals 34.78. There we go. That's stock splits and stock dividends. I hope that helps a little bit. Nothing crazy. Okay, the next one we're going to do is total return. Is this should show up on the 7 and probably the 65 and 66, so be ready for it. Okay, so I'm going to do a basic one, and then I'll show you a couple from, from the test, um, what, what they could be looking like. So here's the thing. Total return is you can include the growth and any income you get, any cash in or out, right? So I don't know how out would go, but maybe uh, commissions or something, but figure it's any um, capital appreciation or growth plus the dividend you get. So in this case, right, I have... I bought 100 shares at 50. It went to 60, so I made $10, right? So I made 10 bucks. Made 10 bucks, but I also got a $2 dividend, so that's another $2, right? So that's a total of 12 bucks. I take that 12 and divide it by the 50. 12 divided by 50 equals 24%. That's my total return. All it is, it's not hard. We're gonna do a couple problems with it, but it's not that hard. It's your growth plus your dividend, divided by the original. Now, if they have to describe it, it's your ending value minus your beginning value plus or minus cash divided by the beginning value. Crazy words. Let's get on to it. So a firm is underwriting a convertible preferred issue of ABC, par value is 120, the yield is 10%, and the conversion ratio is six to one. The common stock is trading at 15 per share and the call price is 150. If held for one year and called away, what is the return? So let's get into this. So first we have to say it's called, so we have to decide what we're going to do. So let's figure it out. So the first thing we have to do is do we let it, it's going to be called at 150, but if we convert, we're going to do six, because that's the ratio, six times where the stock is trading at 15. So we go six times 15 equals 90. So I'd rather let it be called. So I'm going to accept the 150 call. So I'm going to tender the call. So that makes it good. So I bought it at 120 and sold it at 150, right? So 120. So I can even do it the way they do it, right? So let's say the way they say it. 150 minus 120 equals 30. So I made $30 right there. But now, he listen, here, this is the key. We we said if held for one year, okay? If held for a year, that means we have to count the dividend here. So held for one year, that means we have to deal with this. And this is 10% of 120, right? So 10% of 120 is $12. So we made $12 there. So we made a total of 42 bucks. Now, that's great. I made $42, but I have to figure out what my total return is because remember, that's a growth in the money. So I'm going to do 42 divided by 120. That equals 35%. So that's a 35% total return. Not a bad return in one year. Okay. So again, I start with the 120. I go to 150. I made $30 right there. Then I also made $12 because 10% yield on 120 is $12. I made 30 plus 12 equals 42. There's my 35%. Let's try another one. Okay, so here's another example. 100 shares of JLK are purchased at a 30 per share and sold the year later for 26. Ah, we lost money that time. So, and a cash dividend of $2 is paid. So the total return is, let's do this. Also remember, if you hear the word holding period return, it's the same as total return. So we're gonna do a little mathy here. Let's get this on here. So we started at 30 and we went down to 26. So we actually lost four. You don't have to do, a lot of people try to do the 100 times 30 is three grand. You don't do the numbers. If it's percentages, you don't need the dollars. Just do the percentages. So we lost four bucks. We're going to say we lost four here. And then we got a $2 dividend. So that's kind of a plus two, right? That'd be a plus two. So in reality, net, net, we ended up losing $2. Fine. So we just, remember, it's ending minus beginning. But there it is. Negative four plus the cash plus two. We lose negative two, and they're going to divide that. What are we going to do? Yeah, we're going to divide that. If I can figure it out, let me just do it that way. That's the easiest way. I'm just a rambling man, just rambling. Divided by the original of 30, and that's going to equal negative 6.67%. Really, 66666. But there it is. That's total return. Not super hard. I even gave you two hard questions. So that's, boom, I love it. Okay, we also have to talk about earnings per share, but this is super easy. Just earnings per share is literally the earnings divided by the number of shares. And then we have PE ratio we're going to do together. 
Okay, here's the basic stuff. I mean, you may get an actual balance sheet, but it'd be easy to find. So we take the annual earnings. Earnings per share is earnings divided by shares, okay? But it's really earnings available to common. So if they mention the preferred, we got to deal with it. So we have a million shares outstanding, okay? That million share. Okay, so earnings per share is literally earnings divided by shares. Look, we're dumbasses. So we got to kind of have, we got to kind of make sure that we understand the ratios and stuff like that. So we got to put the name in it. Earnings per share. It's earnings divided by shares. Earnings divided by total outstanding shares. So the thing is here, we made a million dollars. That's our annual earnings. But we do have to deal with the preferred dividends because they get paid before the common. And remember, earnings per share is really earnings available to common per share. So we're going to do annual earnings of a million and outstanding shares of 500 grand. If they don't mention preferred, we just do that. A million divided by 500 grand, that's $2 a share. Okay. But we have the preferred here. So we have to suck that out of the earnings. So we're going to do calculator. 1 million minus 100,000 for the preferreds, that leaves us 900 grand. So we have 900 grand. I'm, I'm, do, I'm stalling because I'm trying to get the words out. Uh, we have 900 grand divided by 500,000, the outstanding shares. So we're going to do 900,000 divided by 500,000. So our earnings to share is now 1.8. So that so if they mention the div preferred dividend, you have to handle it and subtract it from the earnings. If they don't mention it, just do the earnings divided by shares. Now let's jump over to PE ratio. We do do kill two birds with one stone. PE ratio is market price divided by earnings per share. It's also called the multiple. So we're going to do 50 divided by 1.8 equals 27.7. So that is so 27.77. Is my PE ratio, also known as a multiple. And if it's a high PE ratio, if it's a high PE ratio, then it's a um growth stock. If it's a low PE ratio, it's a value stock. It is not harder than this. You're not going to get a lot of questions on it. Now, let's talk about a couple of things. One, if you get a stock split, it does not affect PE ratio. Okay, remember that. So if you get a stock split, okay, if you get a stock split, PE ratio is not affected, it stays the same. Because let's say you had a two for one stock split. What would happen is you would have the market price would drop to 25 and the earnings per share would drop to what, what nine, what is it? 0.9. And it'd still be the same. It's still the same ratio. So the price and the earnings per share would go down, but the PE ratio would stay the same because they go down with the same amount. Now let's say we issue more shares. Let's say we issue more shares. That's going to lower my earnings per share. Okay. Because if I if I issue another five hundred thousand shares, my earnings per share goes from one point eight to like maybe a little under one if it's nine hundred thousand. If the earnings stay the same and I issue another five hundred thousand shares, I would have to do nine hundred thousand divided by one million, and that would give me 0 0.9. So if you issue new shares, you lower your earnings per share. So again, a stock dividend, a issuing more shares. And a stock split would all reduce my earnings per share. Again, this stuff is not brain surgery. It's just a little bit at a time. Okay, so we're going back into the balance sheet a little bit. My version of the balance sheet, it's crap. But I have videos that cover all this. But there's a thing with the, we, the two things we have to worry about here are current ratio and working capital. So current ratio is literally just current assets. What are current assets? Stuff that we're going to get. Current assets are things that we're going to get in a year like get within a year or we have now like cash um accounts receivable stuff like that and then current liabilities are stuff we owe within a year like wages payable the current like the this year's interest payment stuff like that stuff you have to pay out accrued um accrued, accrued liability stuff like that so basically just gonna do a million minus 200 grand. and this is what am i doing working capital current ratio so let's do current ratio so current ratio is a million divided by two hundred thousand, right so they would normally be closer i think but we'll just say current assets of a million divided by current liabilities of 200,000. So that'll be a current ratio of five. That's a high one, right? So basically, again, current ratio is current assets divided by current liabilities. Most of the time, you just got to recognize it, okay? I even make it a capital L just for emphasis. So that's going to be current ratio. Correct. That's a little um, Jamaican. Current ratio. Now, if they ask for the quick ratio, current inventory and cash and stuff like that is part of current assets. So quick ratio is literally current assets minus inventory 
over the current liability. So it's the same thing, except for they subtract inventory or just don't count inventory as part of this. Now, working capital is just as easy. It's current assets minus current liabilities. It's kind of like telling us how much money we kind of have to fuck around with, okay? So current assets minus current liabilities. So our working capital here, working capital would be 800,000. That makes sense? Okay. Now there's a question they can ask you. I don't think they do it on the test, but the vendors do. They go, what happens when we declare a dividend? You know, we declare a $100,000 dividend, just say, and then we pay a $100,000 dividend. Let's throw that extra zero on there for good measure. Okay. So once we declare the dividend, we owe it. We're not paying it, so our assets are still good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cross out the 200 grand, right? And then we owe more, so we owe an extra 100. So our current liabilities, I'll put it over here to offset, are 300,000. So our new working capital is now only seven because we've declared a dividend and we increased our liabilities. Now watch the magic here. I, I always like that zero. It doesn't come on. Once we pay the dividend, well, now we pay it out of our current assets. So this is going to go down. This is going to go down. We paid out 100. It's going to go down to 900 grand. I keep doing that button. So our new current assets is 900,000. But now we don't owe that. Three, the, the, we don't owe the 100 on the dividends anymore. So our current liabilities go back down to 200,000. Well, so look at that. It stays the same. So paying the dividend doesn't affect working capital and net worth. Um, just declaring it does. Or are we? So current assets minus current liabilities, working capital of 800 grand. I declare a hundred thousand dollar dividend. That doesn't affect this yet, but I do owe that money. So now I owe 300 grand. So my net worth, my working capital is now only 700,000. The reason I keep saying net worth is because if I just took off the word current, that would be the net worth or shareholders equity. So if I did total assets minus total liabilities, that would be net worth, but I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that today. So current assets minus current liabilities is my working capital. If I declare a dividend, my liabilities go up. So now my working capital goes down. And when I pay the dividend, both my assets and the liabilities go down the same amount. So it does not affect my working capital. There we go. Now dividend payout ratio. And I'm just gonna show, I don't even have formulas for it, but it's literally dividends paid divided by earnings per share. It's that it. So if we have an earnings per share of, let's say, $5 a share, earnings per share. And we pay out, what well, would be tricky, we'll pay out a 25 cent quarterly dividend. What's my payout ratio? Well, we have to multiply that times four. So that's going to be a dollar. Okay. So we're going to go 25 cents times four. So we have a dollar annual dividend, right? Divided by five. So that's going to be, what is that? Uh, 20%. That's a dividend pay ratio. Not fucking hard, okay? Again, none of this master this shit is hard. It's just that people freak out because they think it's hard. And the vendors, especially Kaplan and Pest Perfect, will go too deep on it and try to throw you five-step problems. Okay, a real quick one I'm going to talk about is debt-to-equity ratio. I'm not going to do the math. Nobody cares about the math. They're not going to make you do the math. You just have to know that it's total debt divided by total equity, the shareholder's equity, okay? So again... Total debt divided by equity. So it's what the creditors have versus what the shareholders have. A one to one means you have a ratio of one means you have just as much debt as you have equity, the same amount. That's okay. Anything over two is a little risky, but anything under one means you're in a strong position. That's it. Okay. So now let's get into a little mutual fund stuff. So this stuff's easy, but let's just get into it. Okay. So let's say we have an NAV of 10 bucks and a POP of 50. So a couple things I might ask. They say, mate, and I don't know if you're going to see a lot of this, but in you might even see it on the six, you know, not as much as a seven. So we have to figure out the sales charge. The sales charge is what they add to the NAV for what, when you buy mutual fund. So it's always going to be the NAV plus the sales charge equals POP. So in this case, we can agree that it's probably 50 cents. There's $10 plus 50 cents equals 10.50. So that's a comma 50. That's just crazy shit. That's 50 cents. So that's a 50 cent sales charge per share. That's great. But the question is, is that too high a percentage? So if you want to figure out what the sale, what the sales charge percentage is, remember the, it's the sales charge is a percentage of the POP. Crazy math. So what you have to do is do 50 cents 
divided by the POP, not the NAV. So you're going to do 50 cents divided by the POP of 1050 equals 4.7. So this is going to be 4.7%. That's the sales charge percentage. Again, you're going to do, if you want to know the formula, it's POP minus NAV divided by POP. Crazy, but that's it. Now, let's go the other way. Let's say they go, they don't give us this. Let's see what we're going to do here. Let me erase some shit out of here. I just erased everything. That's wonderful. So we're back to this. And let's... Okay, so let's say they give us an NAV and then they go, well, you have a 7% sales charge. What's your POP? Oh my God, what the hell do I do? What do I do? I can't, if I can't type, it doesn't help. I know what I'm doing. There you go. Now, 7% sales charge. I have a $10 NAV. You go, oh, it's just 70 cents. It's not. Because remember, it's out of the POP. So you have to do, this is what you're going to do. You're going to do, I'm going to say this thing over and over again. You need 10 divided by 100 minus the sales charge in percentages. So you're going to do 100 minus 7, so that's 93%. 100% minus 7% is 93%. So you're going to do the NAV divided by 93%, which you can just do 0.93. So you're going to do 10 divided by 0.93%. So our sales charge in this case would be, I guess, 75 cents, but the POP is going to be 10.75. I hope you guys did that with me. So let me try one more just so we have it, because I haven't seen this on a test yet, but I would like to just not take a chance that it isn't there. All new numbers. Tap them out. NAV. Let's say the NAV is $8. And let's say, oh, I almost did the POP. We want to know what the POP is. And we have a 4% sales charge. But what do we do again? We do 100 minus the sales charge. That gives us 96%. So we're going to do 8. 8 divided by 0.96 gives us. 8.33. Boom. 8.33 is our POP. I love it. There you go. Not hard. It's, it just looks a little complicated. Again, I wouldn't worry about it. I keep saying this over and over again. The formulas and the math are not going to be the thing that kills you. It's not a math test. There will be math on it, but it's not a math test. Okay, so here's a strange one. I don't even know how to explain how to do the math, and it's not going to show up a lot. But read this one. A front-end sales load, class A shares, 5.75%. Customer vets is $1,000. How much is invested in the fund? So remember, it's not, you're, you're putting in 1,000. The sales charge comes out of what you put in. And that is what we understand, that the sales charge comes out of what you put in. So we have to do, okay, 5.75% of 1,000. Remember, the sales charge is from what you put in, the POP. So we're going to do 1,000 times 0. 0.0575. That means it's 5750. So we're going to pay a sales charge of 5750 we're going to subtract that from a thousand one thousand minus 5750 is nine four nine hundred and forty two dollars and fifty cents so just remember the sales charge comes out of what you put in it's not like you put in a thousand and then they go okay give us another you know 5750 no it comes out of that math and again that this is not super hard i just wanted you to see it okay this i don't know if you need it again but it's good it's always fun to do Dollar cost averaging, since I'm in mutual fund world, dollar cost averaging is usually the best way to invest in a mutual fund. And why is that? Well, because as you're putting money in, you're getting closer and closer to a break point. So eventually you hit a break point and then you get lower sales charges. But again, dollar cost averaging is going to give you a better cost, a lower cost than average price over the same time. They're never going to ask you to compare, but let's do this. So if I put a thousand, remember dollar cost averaging, it's putting the same amount of money in every single time period. So let's say over a three-month period or a three-week period, we put $1,000 in each each week, and this is what it was. How do we figure out what our actual average cost was? So we put $1,000 in at $25 a share. That's going to be 40 shares. Then we're going to do 1000 We buy $1,000 worth, and it's $40 a share. That's going to be 25 shares. And then $1, another $1,000 at 20 a share. That's going to be 50 shares. So we bought a total of how many shares? 50 plus 25 plus 40 equals 115 shares. So I bought a total of 115 shares. Now the question is, how much did we spend? Well, we only spent 
three grand. So that's going to be 3,000 divided by 115. So let's do it. 3,000. I did 30,000. Super aggressive. Divided by 115 equals 2608. So our average cost is 26.08. And that definitely is better than the other way. Because what we would have normally done is if, if we didn't do dollar cost averaging and we were going to buy the same 115 shares, we would divide it by three. We're not going to do the math because you don't need it. And it would end up being a lot more because we'd still buy more shares at 40 and more shares at 25. It would have been worth. So our average price is 26.08. Not too bad. And that's dollar cost averaging. Nothing crazy. Now, what's cumulative preferred? I suppose participating means you get a bonus if they have a good year. Convertible means it turns into convertible stock. We did that already, which is good. She did that way back an hour ago. Now we're going to talk about cumulative preferred. What does that mean? It means it makes up all the previous dividends. It makes up all the previous dividends that we missed. Take a look at this question, okay? I want to just revel in the, soak in the complexity of this question right now. Okay, so I want you to soak in the complexity of this question. It looks hard, but remember, this is my mantra. It's always very, if you take a little tiny steps, you can just work your way through almost any of these questions. Because if it's really hard math, not a thing. Okay. A customer owns 4,700 shares of ABC, 5% cumulative preferred, 25 par, that matters. Dividend on a quarterly basis. ABC has not paid the dividend on these shares for the last five quarters, but it's profitable again. How much does ABC owe the customer in back dividends? Not the new dividends. They specifically say the back dividends, okay? So how do we do that? So first we're going to do, we owe, we have not paid for five quarters. So the first thing we have to find out what a dividend will be. So we're going to do, we're going to, first thing we're going to do is going to do, take the 25 par, $25 par, and multiply times the 5%, because that's, right? Let me get rid of the word par, it makes it look confusing. So we're going to multiply that times 5%, because that's what it's paying. It's a 5% preferred. So we're going to do 25 times 0.05 or 5%. That means it's $1.25. So the full year's dividend is $1.25. But now the question is, we missed five quarters, and how do we get there? So the next thing we're going to do is divide the one twenty-five by 4 to find out how much each quarterly dividend is. Okay, so $1.25 divided by 4 is 31 and a quarter cents. That's what we're, each quarterly dividend is going to be. 31.25, 31, 31, cent, 31 and a quarter cents per share. So that's 31 and a quarter cents. I'll put it up here. 31 and a quarter cents. Oh, that is just horrible. I do my best work at 2 a.m. And that's what I'm doing. And maybe it's not my best work. So that's 30, 31.25 cents per dividend. So then we how many dividends we miss. We're going we're gonna to multiply that times five because we missed five dividends. That's going to equal 0.3125 times five equals 1.56. 1.5625. That's how much per share, per share we owe in dividends to the shareholders. So then we just do 1.5625 times how many shares? 4,700. That equals 7,343. Boom, there's C. So let me walk through this again just so you don't get lost, okay? Because I, you can easily get lost. There's so many moving parts. First, we find out how much the actual dividend is. So 25 times 5% equals $1.25. Because remember, par, it's always a par. Now we have to find out what that is in a quarterly basis. We divide that by four. That's quarterly equals 31 and a quarter, 31 and a quarter cents. I'm saying that right. Now we have to figure out if that's one quarter, but we missed five quarters. So we have to do 31.25 times five. That's going to be 1.56. And we multiply that times the number of shares. And that gives us 7343. So I know a lot of you guys do. The, this is the same thing that you're doing with the other one, where you figure out what the previous dividends were, what they're missing, and then add this year's. They didn't ask what this year's was. They just said, how many did they have to pay in back dividends? That's all they asked. They didn't, you have to pay attention. If they said, how much are they going to pay this year? You would add $1.56 plus either 31 and a quarter cents or $1.25, depending on when in the year it was. So that's, if they, again, if they ask, what do I have to do to catch up and be a, a current, I'd have to pay the previous ones and this year's quarterly dividend. Okay. Hope that helps a little bit. Don't let this shit scare you. Maybe you see a question like this and now you know how to work through it. 
Okay, so here's another one that you just got to try to work through. I've seen those in STC. I've seen it in quite a few places. So let's try to get through this. So remember, an ADR represents foreign security. Nine times out of 10, they're just going to want to know that. But in case they make you do the math, here we are. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to work through this piece by piece. So everyone take a chance to read it. Press pause. Read it because I don't want to wait too long because I want to get to bed at some point. Now, the far, it's a $540 per ordinary share in Whenever they say ordinary, they mean the actual, the ADR is ours, okay? The ordinary, if you're ordinary, that means the actual in the foreign country, the ADR is our shares. We read through the whole thing. There are certain keywords that we have to think about. So let's box, let's let's draw around some of these. So we have, we know that the stock is at 40, 540. We know we have 500 shares and it's worth 10%. Remember, the actual ADR is worth 10% of the stock. So it's going to be not going to be worth 540. It's going to be worth 10% of 540, which is going to be $54. Now, how many shares do we have? Well, it's 500. So we're going to do 54 times 500. Let's bang that one out. 54 times 500. So that's 27,000. So now we know it's either C or D. So it's 27,000. The next part is it's worth 10% of the dividend. It's still 10%. So twelve fifty a share times ten percent works out to be a dollar twenty five. Dollar twenty five one point two five times five hundred shares again is six hundred and twenty five bucks. Yay! Oh, but we missed a word. Now remember something. Let's show you. You got to read every. Remember, read the fucking question. Always read every word. There is also semi annual payment. They want to know the semi, not the annual payment, the semi annual payment. So you're going to cut this 625 divided by 2 is 312.50. So the answer here is C as in Charlie. Boom. That's a hard one. Just again, even these hard ones, that's what I'm trying to show you. Just break them down into little bits and they should be easier. Okay. So let's talk about our rights offering a little bit. Okay. So everyone knows that if hopefully you're this far, you know that if a company issues more shares, they're going to do a preemptive right or a rights offering, give the current shareholders the ability to buy more shares at a discount to, to maintain the percentage ownership. And I know the, the, the value of the right. I've never seen a question on the value of a right. But obviously, I think I've seen questions where they go, how many shares do you get and what do you pay? So remember, a couple of things. When you get a right, you can either exercise it, you can let it expire, which is moronic. You can give it as a gift. You can trade it. You can't redeem it back to the company. So you have to do something with it, either exercise it or subscribe, sell it, which is the same as trading it, give it as a gift or let it expire. Those are the things you can do with it. Now, this one is trying to figure out how much you're actually going to pay to exercise your rights. So let's try to do this, okay? So first of all, let's read it up, press pause. Okay, welcome back. A customer owns a thousand shares of the company ABC. ABC is 10 million shares outstanding and plans to issue another 2 million shares. The customer received the rights he's entitled to which are exercisable at 10% below the closing price of 24. What will the cost to the customer? So we have to figure out a couple of things. There's two ways to do this. First of all, we have to figure out how many shares he's going to buy extra. He or she is going to buy extra. So he has a thousand shares outstanding and they issue more shares. So the way I, I'm going to show you two different ways to do it. I do it this way. I take the 10 million. Let me make it black so we can see it. 10 million. And I go, what the, so I go 10 million and 2 million. We issued 2 million. We had 10 million. That's 20%. How do I figure that out? I do 2 million divided by 10. That's going to give me 0.2, which is 20%, which means they increase the outstanding by 20%. So I'm going to increase my shares by 20%. So he has 1,000. So now add 20% to that. They add an extra 200. So we're going to buy another 200 shares. Now, the other way to do this, since maybe you don't like that way, is this, you know you're getting a thousand rights. You get one right for every share you own. We know that, okay, that's easy. Um, but the question is, how many rights do you have to hand in to get a new share? The other way to do it is this, you do 10 million divided by two. 10 divided by two, that's five. That tells you how many rights you have to hand in. If you do a thousand divided by five, again, back to the 200. So we're gonna get 200 shares. That's, I think that's super easy. If you see it, that's great. And you know the numbers. now. The next part of this is where is it exercisable at 10% below the closing price? 
So we have to do a little math, double stuff. These are hard. I'm showing you some hard questions so that you can handle it. When you go in there, you can kind of, you have the mental capacity to kind of go, oh, wait, these aren't that bad. It's, it's not really algebra. It's just a couple steps. So $24 times 0.1 is 240, right? You can't even say, oh, it's invisible. So now you divide 240, you do 240 minus 24. That means you're buying the shares at 2160. 21.6. So now we're going to get 200 shares at 2160. 200 times 21.6 equals 200. So you probably already figured out already. It's going to be 43.20. Not so bad. Again, all I did was figure out the percentage that they're increasing it. They increased by 20%. So we increased by 20%. 20% 20 of 1,000 is 200. 200 and then 10% below 24, 2160. 200 times our 2160 is our 4320, and that's how much we have to pay to keep our percentage ownership, not to shabba. Okay, so we have the treasury stuff, the bills, bills, notes, bonds, tips, and strips. Well, we know about strips, we know about accretion, but we didn't touch about tips, treasury inflation protection securities. So that's what we're going to do now. So you have to sometimes have to figure out, sometimes have to figure out what you're going to get after the fact. So this is, again, I know it, I, mean, I try to say everything simple, but look, I'm a dumbass. I truly am a dumbass. So if I can do this shit, you guys can try to remember this. So tips adjust for inflation. But remember, it's not the coupon that adjusts. It's the par value that adjusts. So if the inflation goes up by 10%, the par value goes up by 10%. If inflation goes up by 5 the par value goes up by 5 So in this case, read this, press pause, read the question, try to solve it yourself, but I'm going to work through it. You have a $1,000 par, 5% interest rate. Inflation during the year is one is three percent. Now, Kaplan tries to do this and and past perfect where they go, oh, it's over three years, and you have to figure out each half a year. That's so stupid. I don't think I don't never think the test is going to do it like that. So now, I have a one percent, a three percent inflation rate. So I'm going to bump up. So my par value is a thousand. I'm going to do a thousand times three percent. That gives me 30. So my new par value is 1,000 plus 30, 1030. This is the easy part, right? And then the coupon doesn't change times 5%. So what is that going to be? 1,030 times 5% equals 5150. Boom. 51.5. So that's the answer. That's what you're going to get every year. And if they said semi-annually, you would do 51.5 times divided by 2, be 2575. It's not hard on this. So the tips question, not horrendous. All you're doing is adjusting the par value by the inflation rate and then multiplying the coupon by that. Remember, the coupon doesn't change. So you are getting more money. Think about it. Inflation going up by 3%. You're getting 3% more. You're maintaining. It's not the best hedge against inflation. Common stock and, and gold is, but it is what it is. It is what it is, what it is, what it is. Da, da, da. Okay, so another thing we're going to do is ETFs. Remember, so they're going to ask you questions about ETFs. Do they go up, they go down, stuff like that. So we know that a regular ETF goes up and down with the market, but a lot of times they're going to ask leveraged or inverse. So let's try to get into how to do the math on that stuff. Okay, so let's look at this ETF here. Make sure I'm not blocking anything, right? A customer owns a leveraged ETF seek his return of 200%. 200% means 2X, 300% means 3X. Remember that. And this so a 200% major stock index it's trading at 50 on day one. What will the price of the ETF be if on day two the index rises by 10 and then loses 20? So remember, you have to do each step. You can't just go up 10, down 20, it's down 10. You have to go through all the steps. Now remember, this is a 200%, so it's a 2x. So we're going to walk through this whole thing. So on day one, the market went up 10%. But we, since we're 2x, we go up 20%. So 20% of 50 equals... Yes, folks, it is $10. So it is $10. So we started at 50. Then we added $10 because that's 20%. That's going to equal 60 bucks. So now we're at 60. That's day two. Now we start at 60. Remember, we reset. This is why this is not good for long term holdings because it resets every day. So now it's going to go down 20%. We'll do it here so it's not confusing. The market, the market goes down 20%, but that means we're going to go down 40% because we're 2x. So 40%, we have to do the math on this. 60 times 40% equals 
Okay, we'll try it in. 60 times 0.4 equals 24. So we're going to do 60 minus 24 and equals 36. So our new price is 36. That's pretty straightforward. I got one more for us. Okay, here's another one, but this is an inverse ETF, not leverage. Got to read the fucking question inverse. So that means whatever the market does, it's going to do the opposite. So again, here we start at a grand old 10 grand. We're starting at 10,000. And then the market dropped 10. So that means we're going to go up 10%. What's 10% of 10 grand? That's 1,000. So we're going to add $1,000 to this, which is going to equal us 11 grand. I think we're okay with that. Then the next day we started 11 grand and the market went up 5%, which means we're going to go down 5% of 11 grand. So we do 11,000 times 0 0.05 equals 550. 11,000 minus 550 is 10,450. And voila, here we are. Not so bad. Okay. 10,450. Boom, not bad at all. ETF should be a cakewalk for this test. Okay, so now we're talking about alpha and beta, okay? So beta is a multiplier. So if it's above one, it's more volatile. That could really be the question. If the if the beta is above one, it's more volatile, which means it moves more than the market up and more than the market down. And if the beta is less than one, between, between one and one, really. So between one and negative one, it's going to move less than the market. So if you have a beta of 0.5, it's going to move half as much as the market. If you have a beta of negative one, it's going to move the same, but the opposite. If it has a beta of negative 0.5, it's going to move the opposite way, but half as much. So that's just, just remember, you just, whatever your beta is, you multiply that times the market, and that's going to be what your expected return is. So let's do it here. So we got this. We have um, the S&P went up, 12, our, our portfolio is one point, has a beta 1.5. They'll give that to you, if anything. But the market is up 12%, which means we're going to go up 12% times 1.5, right? We're going to do 12 times 1.5 equals, that's 18%. Where is my damn mouth? There it is. So that means we're expected to go up 18%. That's our risk-adjusted beta, whatever you want to call it. But what did we actually do? We actually went up 21%. So we actually went, we did better by 3%. That's our alpha. That's so easy, right? Three points of alpha. Alpha is what you do better than expected. So again, it's against the risk adjusted return. So beta is what you're expected to do. And then alpha is how much you did better than you're expected. So easy. Now, if the market, if we actually did like, you know, 17%, that would be negative alpha of one point. Not so hard. Let's see if I can find a question that'll help. Okay, so let's go through this question. It's a little different, but it's the same theory. A customer portfolio has a beta of 1.25 and it's valued at 20,000. The general market increases at 10%. What's their general result? So this is super easy. You can literally multiply beta times anything here. So you could do 10% times 1.25, right? 10% times 1.25 equals 12 and a half percent, 12 and a half percent of 20 grand, 20 grand times 0.125 is 2,500. So that's the answer. I know it's there, but that's one way to do it. The other, so we could, let me write it out. Just talking in my head. So you would do 10% times 1.25. That equals 12.5%. You're going to do 20,000 times 12.5 percent and that equals 2500 that's one way to do it so many other ways to do it what if we did how about this 20,000 times 1.25 1 1.25 20,000 times 1.25 equals 25,000 25,000 times 10 percent is 2,500. Wow. Magic. Okay. How about this one? There's one more. If I can remember what the hell it is. I can do 10% of 20,000. 20,000 times 10% equals two grand. Then I do the two grand times 1.25. 
that equals up oh, 2,500. Amazing how the numbers keep working. So that's one example of a beta question. Just remember it, the big thing, it's a the multiplier. If it's more than one, it's gonna move more than the market. If it's less than one, it's gonna move less. If it's below zero, same rules. If it's below negative one, it's gonna move less, but the opposite way. If it's more than negative one, it's gonna move more, but the opposite way. Okay, so now we're gonna do this, okay? Margin, I, I have the videos on it. it I don't wanna overthink it, but we're gonna do the basics of margin. Just how to get SMA and equity. So remember, I, in a long margin account, I use the Mr. Desby. Just remember. Now, what is it? M is for, let me make sure. Recording here, yeah, guys. I don't freaking wait. I've done that before. I one time did a video and I recorded like twenty minutes of it, and I'm like, oh look, I never hit the fucking record. Okay, so first of all, M for market value, R for reg T, D for debit balance, what you borrow, E for equity, S for SMA, what you can borrow, and B is buying power. So let's start with this one. Let's say we have a market value of. I keep doing that. Let's say I have a market value of 30 grand. And, and we have to give a debit balance. So we say the debit balance is 12 grand. Why, do, why not make it hard on myself? So I'm going to do 30 grand. So to get equity is always market minus debit. Remember that. M minus D equals equity. Remember, I'm just doing not doing everything. I'm just doing the basic stuff here. 30 grand minus 12 grand. So that should be 18 grand in my book, right? Okay, 18,000 is my equity. Awesome. Now the question is, how much equity do I need? Well, I have 18 grand. I don't need 18 grand. I need half the market value, which is reg T. So I need 15 grand. So I have 18 grand in equity and I only need 15. So I have three grand after extra. So my equity, equity minus reg T equals my SMA because that's what I can borrow. So I they want 15, but if I have more than that, well, then I get to borrow that. That's SMA. So my I have 3,000 in SMA. And just remember, on top of this, buying power equals two times SMA. So boom, my buying power here is going to be $6,000. Not hard. I don't think they're going to go too crazy on this. That's the long side. Let's do the short side. I use a different acronym. Russian children must eat snow, right? Russian children must eat snow. There we go. They they don't really ask buying power on the short side. So, but they, there's certain things they have to give you. They have to give you the credit balance. I'm going to make it 50 grand. And they have to give you the market value or the short market value. We'll call that 30 grand. So that's what it will cost to buy the shares back. So to get equity, it's credit. So equity equals credit balance, which is how much money is in the account minus the current market value, which is what it will cost to buy it back. That's market value. So that's going to be 50K minus 30K equals 20K. So my equity is 20 grand. Easy stuff. Now, how much equity do they want me to have? Do you want me to have half, half of the market value? Remember, half of the market value, not half of the credit balance. They're going to want half of this, not this. So half of 30 is 15. So my reg T is 15 grand. Wow, it's like, it's like algebra. 15 grand. I have 20 grand in equity, my extra. Because look, SMA is the same for both. Sam, who's Sam? SMA is equity minus reg T. So it's going to be equity of 30 minus reg T of 15. So, oh, equity of 20. I'm an idiot. Equity of 20 minus 15. I thought it looked big. So if SMA of five grand, I can borrow that money. That's there's more to margin. I have videos. I'll try to attach it here so you can do a deeper. But that's the basics of it. Okay, this one may or may not show up, but here's so they might talk about your after tax yield. And I know this goes on some of the other exams. So if you learn it now and you take the 65 or 66, you'll be set up in case you see it. So the after tax yield is basically what your what your percentage earning is after you pay your taxes. So we invested 10 grand. And remember, marginal is your top tax bracket. You always use marginal, never use effective. Always use marginal, never use effective. So we invest 10 grand and it grows by two grand. And we're going to pay taxes on that. And then we sell it. Say we grows and we sell it. So we should be fair. We made two grand. We'll call it a realized gain just to get off. To stop my so realized gain of two grand. I like that. So now the question is, what's my after tax return? So let's do the math on that. 
you're going to do two grand. Now remember, so if we're paying 20% in taxes, we're bringing home 80. So if you can't remember that, just do 100% minus 20% equals 80%. Now, remember, this is not the same as a what would you have to pay in taxes. If they said, what is your tax tax liability? You just do the two grand times the 20%, but it's 500 bucks, and that's it. Four, four, five, 400 bucks. That's That would be that. But they're not asking that. They're asking what your actual, your after-tax yield is. So remember, you're paying taxes, and what's left over is your shit. So you're going to do two grand that you made times 80% or 0.8. That equals 1,600. So you have 1,600 in after-tax returns. After you pay your taxes, you leave 1600 Now, you're not done. If that's all they ask, that's great, but they want to know the percentage. And I did 10 grand because it's easy. So I'm going to do 1600 divided by 10000 So that's going to be 16%. So my after-tax yield is 16%. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Pretty easy. Okay, that's kind of it. That's painful, right? I think there's over an hour that's freaking painful as hell. But really, any of math you're going to see on the seven, this video will solve that. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, I'm going to put here or in the beginning, maybe I'll do it, the break, the option break even video I have because that's math, okay? And I'm going to put in my margin videos where I did margin, and I'm up, I may put in with the whole current ratio thing. I'll put my um, resistance is futile video there to help you out. So listen, I love this stuff. I like doing this stuff. It is now two thirty five in the morning. Eastern. I'm super tired. I only have to get up at eight. So it's, I get to sleep a little bit in. Um, thank you guys. But don't forget to check me out every Tuesday and Thursday night on YouTube. I do a live. I don't know if you guys know it. Some people don't. I act like everyone does, but I don't think a lot of people know about it. I ask questions on any test you want. Guys, this is the math on the seven and maybe even the 66. Have a great night. Wash your hands and may the force be with you. Y'all have a good night.